Our next speaker tonight is Robert Brooks. Robert Brooks, he was originally from South Africa, then Townsville University, and since 2001, he's been at the University of New South Wales. He is the founding director of the Evolution and Ecology Research Centre, and he works with his research group, which is called Sex Lab, on the evolution of sex chromosomes, the biology of ageing and obesity, the risks of extinction, and the genetic benefits of male choice. He has experimented on guppies, crickets, beetles, mice, and increasingly on humans. And tonight, he's going to be experimenting on us. So, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Brooks. Am I on? I should change some of the description on my website. It sounds positively sinister. <laughs> how many of you uh, had a one or a two or a three? And how many of you who had a one or a two or three actually found a partner? I saw some very attractive looking people there with ones on their foreheads, and I just thought, now you know what it feels like for the rest of us. <laughs> and how many of you had a 10 or a nine, and you did fine? What was the feeling when, of having all these people wanting you? <laughs> it's, a, it's a remarkable thing. That's something that, that happens to us as we start to enter the, the dating and then the marriage market. We start to get something of a sense of our value. Um, we, we, we often talk, biologists often talk like economists about it being a market. Um, and we get a feeling of our value and what we could perhaps demand for our services or our goods. I'm not sure which they are. Um, but uh, nonetheless, that's something that we get a sense of from the feedback we get from people who are uh, attracted to us, who are interested in us, etc. And of course, we don't get a perfect idea. Uh, but at some level, all of the things that Bill was talking about feed into this idea of, of, of your value as a mate, uh, which seems like a really harsh thing to say. Are we all ones to tens? And I'm going to try and address some of that and some of the complexities around that in a moment. Um, I come out of a field called behavioral ecology, and in behavioral ecology, this particular bird, the widow bird, has a very special place. And it's, the, it's what I call the sort of um, founding organism of the, or the, the mascot of the hot or not paradigm. Now, hot or not is a, a website in the States, a dating website, and we'll get onto them in a moment. But for a long time, people doubted Darwin's explanation for things like the tail of the widow bird. Now, these birds, if you've ever been to Africa, you would have seen them flapping. They're like a swimmer trying to stay just above the water when they're learning butterfly. If your kids have ever learned butterfly, or if you've ever tried it, it's this floundering above the grass stems. And it looks kind of pathetic because the males carry this enormous tail. And Darwin said that tail is there because it's attractive to females. The males with the big tails get all the matings. And because Victorian biologists were largely gentlemen, and they were largely gentlemen of a certain um, uh, attitudes to sex, certain Victorian attitudes to sex, they were somewhat incredulous about the notion that, that females really did choose their mates and that they, um, you know, they could have such power to direct evolution. And of course, only in as late as the 70s and 80s did this idea really get good empirical support. And the first thing, the first great example used the sophisticated te uh, technique of some scissors and some superglue. And this guy, Malty Anderson, Swedish fella, went out to Africa and he cut the tails of widow birds and he removed a little bit out of the middle of the tail. doesn't hurt. It's all dead like hair, okay? Removed a little bit out of the middle and shortened some tails. And he took that bit and he put it into other individuals' tails and lengthened their tails. And he showed that the male widow birds that have longer tails end up having more females come and nest on their territories and mate with them, etc. What he's demonstrating essentially is that males with long tails get more matings, pass on those genes for long tails, and as a consequence, that's how the tail gets exaggerated. All right, so it's very simple. And the nice thing about this is the variation is in one dimension. It's really just have you got a big one or don't you? And that's often how we think about mate choice. Now, if you read the journals that I read, Cosmo, um, <laughs> Vanity Fair, um, you, you will have read about waist-to-hip ratio. Waist-to-hip ratio is a nice, simple measure that we often use to um, uh, understand, essentially, how the fat has been laid down on a man or a woman's body. 
And the idea here is that um, if you've laid down slightly too much fat, then your waist hip ratio will be not um, at some kind of optimum level. Okay, let me just ex take a step back for a moment and explain the relationship between body fat um, and attractiveness, attractiveness ratings, um, is thought to be underpinned by the fact that body fat's a really, really important thing. It's our fuel, it's our currency in, um, uh, as living organisms, okay? We, we save energy for later, we save it to be used later, but um, unlike money, or perhaps like money, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, okay? Uh, but mostly the problem that our ancestors have faced throughout history is having too little, having too little body fat, and so we find that women who are somewhere down the fashion model end um, of the scale and thinner than that tend not to be attractive on average, even though fashion um, houses don't always get this message, they tend not to be that attractive on average. And, and we think that that's got a lot to do with the fact that around about the level when you become a fashion model, or thinner than that, reproductive systems close down. So women who, who don't have enough body fat just aren't fertile. Similarly, um, once you get to a body mass index of somewhere over 30 or so, where we, we talk about clinical obesity, um, there are other problems with fertility that happen. Not everybody um, s suffers from those, but uh, polycystic ovary syndrome and various other syndromes to do with um, excess body fat also reduce fertility. So there's this optimal window. Um, and that, the, the peak of that, the peak um, attractiveness and the peak fertility tends to be around about the point where women's waists are 70% as wide as their hips. So you have the hourglass figure. And the hourglass figure is something that is sort of worshipped, I guess, in art and, and um, in, in, since 1993 in science. These, these figures here, um, these three women here, come from a very influential paper um, by a guy called Dev Singh, who manipulated by drawing women's body shapes. And he showed that about 70% is optimal. All right? Now, the problem that I have with that view is obviously that it's very narrow. Um, and, and it's very, well, two-dimensional, waist and hips. So it's a little bit more sophisticated than the idea of, of um, the length of a tail. But um, there's much more to somebody than their waist to hip ratio. There's much more to somebody than how tall they are or how um, square their chin is or how feminized their face is. Uh, and how do we integrate all of these different things, all of the many different things that we find attractive? The hot or not paradigm is, and, and, and this is... The, what we were doing with this exercise with having a number, being somewhere on a scale between a 1 and a 10, is epitomized in the, the US website, Hot or Not. Basically, you're presented with pictures, you can go and visit there, you don't have to register for, for the dating site to rate these, these people, um, and you say, I want to rate women, or I want to rate men, and um, images come up and you click whether they're hot or not, or somewhere in between. And everybody gets reduced down to a nice little linear score between really, really hot and not so hot, which must be kind of um, depressing if you're down the left-hand side. Um, but uh, there's some things that we can learn and we will learn about um, how to present yourself on um, these kinds of sites. But really, <laughs> this is the kind of um, linearization of attractiveness, the idea that we're somewhere when we fit, most of us fit somewhere in the middle and some people are really hot and some people just genuinely really are not. Not a very happy message for Valentine's Day, that. But there are a few, a few really liberating things that we can get from evolutionary biology that don't have to do with um, everybody being a 10 or, you know, the, the winners being a 10 and everybody else has tough luck. And the first thing is that we're kind of saved by not monogamy. We're saved by the fact that most of the time we tend to behave and we tend to pair up in mostly monogamous type of arrangements. Obviously, in lots of societies there, are, there is polygyny. But nonetheless, when people get married or they enter into a relationship, they're sort of taken out of the pool of people who are really looking for a relationship. That's kind of the point. And so when Angelina Jolie gets taken by Brad Pitt, and they're both tens and that's wonderful for them, um, that takes, that takes her out of the gene pool, but it also takes out um, a dude who's um, a very, very strong competitor. And so, as a consequence, as the 10s start to pair up and the 9s start to pair up, and Warney, who's a 2, starts to pair up with Liz, who's about a 9, <laughs> um, what we start to find is that the 7s the and 8s are left, and they're the hottest people that are out there. And, um, 
etc. Et um, we tend to find very quickly sort of what our market value is and we tend to gravitate to other people who have a similar kind of market value. It doesn't really subvert that whole business though of either being very hot or very not. There's something else that's really important and that is that not everything, not all of those genes that Bill spoke about are genes that you can say this is a good type of gene and this is a bad type of gene. Often there's a, there's a question of a match how well matched individuals are to one another. And sometimes the, the best genes for me might not be the best genes for Bill in a mate. And so as a consequence of that, we don't necessarily compete for the same mates. If you've ever got really, really close to somebody, possibly for the first time, there's a very, very strange feeling in your tummy and it's a very, very biological feeling, or at least it feels that way to me. And you think, as, as a radio host said um, to me today on air, when we were talking about this, she said, hmm, yes, I could have five babies with you very easily. And she wasn't saying that to me. She was simply saying it in the conversation. But, um, but you get that feeling very quickly. And, um, and, and so we, we need to make that match with the right kind of complementary genes as well. Our immune systems, for instance, need to be very diverse. We can't simply pair up with somebody who's got the same types of genes as us because as a consequence, our children will have fewer tools in their immune toolkit, okay? Um, whereas if you, if you actually pair up with somebody who has very different immune system genes, your, your children are gonna have a variety of tools to operate with. And so we have more subtle strategies that are also very strongly genetic, that are also about good genes, but they're about genes that are a good match. And if we make a bad match, we often feel the consequences. Now, there was a great story in um, the uh, sort of circulating last week. It got a lot of news coverage. My colleague Simon Griffith at Macquarie University um, published this paper. These are Gouldian finches. They're an endangered species. They're one of Australia's loveliest birds. And the two um, birds on the top there are, are males. They're slightly brighter than the female down there. But what happens with Gouldian finches is that they, they do best if... Um, they mate with uh, other individuals of the same head colour. They have red heads or black heads or yellow heads. Not very many yellow-headed individuals. So red-headed females do better if they mate with red-headed males and black-headed males and females do better if they mate with one another. But because sometimes all the tens are taken or because all the red-heads are taken and you happen to be a red-headed male and there's only black-headed females, sometimes um, you're thrown together by circumstance and you end up with the, the, the bad pairing. Um, and you make a bad match, and it seems that these birds get incredibly stressed out when that happens. They get so stressed out that the females lay smaller eggs, they put less care in, and they're far more likely to sneak off and play away games with males of the right genotype that are nesting nearby but that are already taken. And that's probably true as well um, to some extent of humans, although the, the nuts and bolts of that really need to be sorted out. So that's one way in which we can get beyond hot or not. Here's something else. Um, this is a study that we're doing, and I, I put this in because I really want you to go online and uh, go to bodylab.biz and rate bodies because it's a, pr a project where we're looking at the evolution of bodies. We actually start with 120 bodies, and then we take every few months, we take the most attractive ones, and we make offspring. We mutate them slightly and twiddle with them, etc. <laughs> and we make new bodies, and we get people to rate them, and we're going to look at how things change over time. Um, and if you were in the hot or not um, sort of paradigm, you would say the, the body on the left is uh, less hot than the body on the right, and everything lines up all in one row, and you might be able to choose a couple of simple measures. Let's say waist to hip ratio, for instance. A very high waist to hip ratio on the left, very low waist to hip ratio on the right. Um, in our experiments, certainly, as, as these bodies have evolved, this is sort of what we're seeing. We're seeing some changes, and the obvious one you can see is, is just in how heavy set those bodies are. Um, this is true of both the male and female bodies. But there's much more to it, and this is the point. There's a lot more to making an attractive body than just how narrow the waist is or how much fat is deposited on the body. For instance, busts have gotten smaller throughout our experiment, and the reason is partly because bodies have gotten smaller, but busts have gotten smaller relative to waist and hips, etc. We're not entirely sure why that is. Arms have gotten narrower, um, legs have gotten narrower, legs have also gotten taller, um, and the neck has gotten narrower. So a number of different changes have occurred 
And we've, what we're finding is if you, if you allow them to vary in 25 different dimensions, every single one of those measures contributes to the attractiveness of the body. What's really important is that the body is well integrated. It's possible to be a very, very small, petite person and be very attractive if you have the right combination of waist and hips and bust and leg length, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's possible to be very tall. It's possible to be very heavy set and very well and very attractive as long as the body is really well integrated. So the important thing is, I guess, not to reduce people to a single dimension. And when you go beyond bodies to faces to personalities to senses of humour to all of those types of things, of course, it gets infinitely more complex. But you can see that there are a number of ways. As long as everything works together. Um, there are lots of different ways to be very attractive. Now, um, this is some data that from a very interesting post. It, is, it actually isn't a peer-reviewed scientific paper, but it's something that, that illustrates some stuff that we found earlier um, several years ago with guppies. It's from the OKCupid okay um, website, which is a little bit more enlightened than hot or not. It's also a place where you go and you upload your details and stuff. Um, and people do, visitors do rate the attractiveness of the profiles that come up. So you say, oh, I'm interested in women and I live in Sydney and uh, you maybe get 25 profiles come across your desk and you can give them a rating between one star and five stars um, in terms of looks. Um, and that's what's on, on the bottom axis of this from, from sort of people who are rated very low in terms of looks to people who are rated incredibly attractive in terms of looks. But the, the really cool thing about this is that the people who run this website also keep track of how many messages folks get sent, how many contacts get initiated. Um, and it seems like, obviously, very attractive people get by far more um, messages initiated. In fact, um, if you're very attractive, you get 25 times as many on average um, as somebody who's rated in the lower 10% of attractiveness ratings. But there's an enormous amount of noise. And the thing I want to finish with today is talking about that noise. Because every one of those dots is an individual person. And the really important thing is that we don't mate with, it doesn't matter how generically cute we are. It doesn't matter how attractive we are to the whole world. What it matters is how attractive we are to individuals. Because you're not going to mate with the whole world. Well, let's hope not. You're going to end up mating with an individual, um, or having a relationship with an individual. So they did some really cool analysis of the basis of this spread, this variation. Um, you can be uh, only of average attractiveness and still get as many messages, in fact, five or six times more than somebody who is um, in, in the very highly attractive rating bracket. So here's an analysis of two real women, and they consented to allow, allowing this, and I even got permission um, to talk about this. But here is a woman who's rated about a seven on average. Um, and here is another woman who's got a slightly higher average rating, but she got, um, what, about a third as many messages. And you may have a subjective opinion, and I should have got the clickers out so that you could vote on this, and you might all have a subjective opinion about which one of those two is more attractive. Um, but the question is, why did the, the woman on the, um, on the top with the red star um, get so many more messages? And here, I want to talk about the ultimate liberating message, and this is the importance of a beautiful mind. And I don't really mean, although it is our biggest sex organ um, and our most sort of flexible and versatile sex organ, our mind, um, and of course, by far the most important thing is, is that you find somebody who has a beautiful mind. But what I really mean is a beautiful mind, as in the movie, A Beautiful Mind. And you might have seen, how, how many of you have seen the movie? So the movie is about John Nash, who um, is one of the folks who, who gave us game theory. Game theory is an economic body of theory that says it doesn't matter just what individuals, what the best thing for an individual to do is, you're also pl playing in a game. And so what you've got to do is pick the right strategy in relation to what everybody else is doing. And so here we're going to watch this video clip and I'll come back to you in a moment. Here, uh, Russell Crowe is playing John Nash and they're in a bar um, sometime in the 40s, I think. I will not buy you gentlemen beer. Oh, we're not here for beer, my friend. Oh. Huh. Does anyone else feel she should be moving in slow motion? Uh, <laughs> will she want a large wedding, you think? Should we say swords, gentlemen? Pistols at dawn? Have you remembered nothing? Recall the lessons of Adam Smith, the father of modern economics. In, uh, in competition, 
individual ambition serves the common good. Exactly. Every man for himself, gentlemen. Yeah, and those who strike out are stuck with their friends. Uh, I'm not going to strike out. You can lead a blonde to water, but you can't make a drink. I don't think he said that. All right, nobody move. She's looking over at him. Right, she's looking at Nash. Oh, God. All right, he may have the upper hand now, but wait until he opens his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you remember the last time? Oh, uh, yes, that was one of the history books. <laughs> Adam Smith needs revision. What are you talking about? If we all go for the blonde. We block each other. Not a single one of us is going to get her. So then we go for her friends. But they will all give us the cold shoulder because nobody likes to be second choice. But what if no one goes for the blonde? We don't get in each other's way, and we don't insult the other girls. And it's the only way we win. That's the only way we all get laid. <laughs> Adam Smith said, the best result comes from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself, right? That's what he said, that's right? Incomplete, incomplete, okay? Because the best result would come <laughs> from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself and the group. Ash, this is some way for you to get the blonde on your own. You can go to hell. Governing Let's... dynamics, gentlemen. Governing dynamics. Adam Smith. What's wrong? Yep, there we go. Careful, careful. Thank you. Okay, so the key thing here is that uh, what Nash was supposedly figuring out, and if you'll excuse the bizarre 1940s sexual politics there, um, is that in a, in a mating situation, it's not all about this kind of competition is fantastic Adam Smith type economics. Because, of course, if everybody competes for the most attractive person in the room, then the other women are going to feel... Um, left out, and, and uh, rightly so, and as a consequence, nobody's going to be going home with anybody. Um, and so what, what people need to do is they need to adjust their strategy in relation not only to what they, what, who they find attractive, but also uh, who they think everybody else is going to find attractive. And that's what I think is happening with these two women over here. The crucial thing here is in the distribution of their ratings, of their ratings from one star to five star. The, the woman on the left, you can see, is what we might call generically cute. Everybody gives her about a four. Not too many people thought she was a five. Uh, and, but not too many people thought she was a zero, or, or sorry, a one or a two or a three. So she's getting this, she's doing really well um, in terms of the generically cute thing, but she's the kind of girl that might not get as much attention because everybody goes, well, she's kind of attractive and um, doesn't think that they necessarily have a chance with her. Whereas... Um, the, the person on the right, um, there's a lot of guys who just don't find her attractive at all and plenty of guys who find her supremely attractive. Um, those guys who find her supremely attractive, of course, are going to send her messages, but part of why they find her attractive is, in fact, that they know that she's not everybody's cup of tea. They know that the competition is much lower. And the lesson from this, the important lesson from this, because I know that some of you will be going out to dinner with your beloveds and some of you will be going home to have a think about it, and some of you will be going home to get on OK Cupid and say, how do I get me a bit of that? <laughs> the important thing about this is that you've got to make sure that you follow the oldest advice in the book. And the oldest advice in the book is, of course, meet lots of people, and go out and do th social things, and walk around with a number on your forehead, and <laughs> try to be yourself. Show everybody else um, who you are. Um, and don't try to hide the fact that you're slightly overweight or that you've got a slightly dodgy tattoo or that you might have some politics that some people might find are vaguely repellent. Because in the end, they're going to find that stuff out anyway. But it's the quirky stuff that endears us to other people. And it's the quirky stuff um, that makes us attractive. And that's the importance of a beautiful mind. So we'll finish there.